I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. On behalf of my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event, Pet Food Basics with Dr. Lisa Wheat. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll send out the link tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to watch it again. Uh, we'll be taking questions via chat and we ask that you please save your questions until the end of the presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Lisa Weath is a board certified veterinary nutritionist who received her veterinary degree from the University of California, Davis in 2002. She spent two years in general and emergency practice before returning to UC Davis for a residency in clinical nutrition. She completed her residency in 2007 and has been in specialty practice ever since. In 2018, she joined the Metropolitan Animal Specialty Hospital in Los Angeles as the head of the hospital's nutrition department. In addition to her clinical practice, Dr. Weath serves on the World Small Animal Veterinary Association Global Nutrition Committee and is on the executive board for the American Association of Veterinary Nutrition. We are so grateful to her for being with us to lead tonight's event. Please welcome Dr. Lisa Wheat. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you everyone for taking time off your Wednesday evenings um, to spend some time with me talking about nutrition. So I am going to share my screen now um, and we will get started. The, uh, if I can, I feel like after two years of doing Zoom, I should have this down pretty quickly, but <laughs> it still takes me a while just so I'm not covering myself up too much. All right, so hopefully everyone can see my intro slide. Um, I try to throw pictures of the patients I see either, most of these are MASH patients, so within the last we have three, four years. Um, I have a few older ones, so I practiced in New Jersey um, after I finished my residency, so I was at Red Bank Veterinary Hospital for six and a half years. And so if every so often, I, if I have a good picture from an old a New Jersey client, I throw them in there too. Um, but we're gonna cover just some general kind of how to evaluate diets, how to look at diets for your dogs and cats, a little bit of basics of pet nutrition, um, just so you have an idea of when you're selecting diets or when you're thinking about selecting diets, what should you look for? What should you look for avoiding? Uh, so when we think about dogs and cats as society, one of the critiques that some people will give on commercial pet foods is that you know dogs and cats have been with humans for thousands and thousands of years tens of thousands of years for dogs and the commercial pet food industry is relatively new so why should we feed a dry kibble why should we feed a can or even a commercial fresh food diet when historically dogs just ate whatever we were eating um, and the reason why I, I, I still do recommend feeding these commercial complete and balanced diets or a home cooked complete and balanced diets is that the role of dogs and cats in our society has changed quite a bit from when they first started adapting to life with humans. Early dogs and cats um, weren't necessarily in your home, sleeping in your bed. They had specific functions in the family. They were a hunting dog. They were a herding dog. They were protection. Cats were mousers. They were keeping vermin out of grains or out of out of your home home um, pantries. And so they didn't really have the same role that they do now. Um, and I would say that most of our companion dogs, a lot of our companion dogs are now treated like members of the family. They are either like a kid in the family or have replaced the kids um, in the family and they, they go everywhere with us. They get dressed up, they, they get put into strollers, they wear, you wear them in little pohooses. Um, it's a very different role than a dog that's scrounging or pooping out in the back 40 and you don't have to worry about what it is that they could be picking up and passing through to people. And because a lot of these animals, again, they're companions, they're part of our family. They're living in our homes, they're sleeping on the kids' bed, they're sleeping in our bed, they're sleeping by our heads. Um, and so we want to make sure that they're staying as healthy and happy for as long as possible um, and not just surviving because that's a pretty low threshold for just basic survival. We want them to be with us forever. So if we think about the history of the pet food industry, again, relatively new and relatively young compared to the rest of the dog, you know, dogs and cats with society, really commercial pet food started just a little over a hundred years ago. So the late 1800s or late, I should say 1900s, so 1880s, 1890s, 
was when the first commercial kind of like tack biscuits came on the market. And they were really just utility foods for hunters, for people going on ships or traveling long distances with their dogs. And they really didn't know a lot about what basic nutrient requirements were. And that's true for nutrient requirements for people, let alone for dogs and cats. It really wasn't until the early kind of 1900s, so 1920s, 1930s, and 40s, where a lot of the essential nutrients were identified and their roles were identified. And so if you fast forward 100 years, or if you get, you know, 120 some odd years, we have diets on the market that provide all of the basic amino acids, fatty acids, vitamins, and minerals that a dog or cat needs to not only survive day to day, but to grow, to thrive, and to have a long, healthy life. And that's our, again, that's our goal is how do we find a diet to support health and wellness? We can't look into the future or can't look into the past, I should say, because the dog foods of the past had a lot of gaps in them. They didn't, again, they didn't know what they didn't know. So we want to look towards what do we know now? What do we need into the future to keep those animals feeling good and looking good? When I look at diet, um, and this is just my, kind of my perspective on, on food, food is a way to get nutrients in. Dogs and cats need nutrients in their diet. They don't necessarily need ingredients. Ingredients are just the ways to get those nutrients in. So different types of meats have different amino acid profiles. They have different fatty acid profiles. And the combination of those meats with grains or other or vegetables and fruits are going to give us that balanced diet. So we really want a combination of ingredients and a combination of foods to provide that balanced diet. And we have to think about nutrients, meeting nutrient needs, not just, again, basic survival, but how do we optimize health to make sure that that dog or cat is doing well you know, long into the future. And, and I threw this picture, this kitty cat picture here is my own cat, Gamora, who doesn't know that she's supposed to be a carnivore. So her two of her favorite foods are when my husband makes crepes, she loves the crepes. Um, and if we ever have blueberry, she hears the blueberry bowl come out and she comes running, it's like a can opener for her. She comes running from the other side of the house. She loves to eat the blueberries. It's probably more of a texture mouthfeel for her than feeding basic, you know, meeting a basic need. But again, nutrients, ingredients are ways to get nutrients in. So I'm not necessarily worried about her eating carbohydrates as long as her base diet underneath that is complete and balanced for her carnivore needs. And we think about, you know, kind of again, looking at diet as its basic form. So ingredients are a way to get protein, which is a form of nitrogen and basic amino acids and essential amino acids. It's a way to get fats and essential fatty acids in. We need some fat in the diet for vitamin absorption. We need vitamins and minerals coming in either in trace amounts, so in micrograms, a so little tiny, small amounts, or in macro amounts, so whole grams into the diet. And we need water as an essential nutrient. The, the kind of category that's considered a little bit optional, and this is where some people get confused about carbohydrates and the role of carbohydrates, is that yes, the, the kind of reality of it is that carbohydrates are not considered essential for life. So you can leave carbohydrates out of the diet for a cat, you can leave them out of the diet for a dog. And as long as everything else is coming in at the right amounts, the dog is getting all of their energy, protein, vitamins, everything they need. The benefit to having carbohydrates in the diet is really twofold. One, it's, you know, I think of this as our, our cheap energy source. So not only cheap in terms of cost, it's a lot, lot less expensive to add, you know, rice or, or chickpeas or, or potato to a diet compared to adding meat. So if we're looking at sources of calories, carbohydrates are just less expensive from a monetary standpoint. Carbohydrates are also easier for the body to break down and absorb. So if we're thinking about ways to get energy, to get glucose into the cells, which is the the currency and the, the nutrient source the cells need for just running basic functions is we need sugar in. Carbohydrates are a really easy way to get those basic sugar units in. Very absorbable, very digestible. Carbohydrates also bring in some fiber, which is, which is absolutely essential for normal colon cell health and for normal bacteria in the GI tract health. So carbohydrates from an essential standpoint, we can leave them out, nobody dies, but the optimal health brings a little bit of carbohydrate for fiber and for that more readily absorbed, readily digested ingredient um, and calorie source. 
And then the picture I have here on the right hand side of the screen, um, this Ibex goat, this is, these are goats that will scale walls and pretty sheer cliff sides and, and dams. You'll see pictures of these, these goats just kind of in random places that you would never expect a goat to get to. And what they're doing is they're seeking out salt dripping from the limestone and dripping from the rock. And that's kind of my reminder to, to the audience that a lot of these essential nutrients are very limiting in nature. So if we're thinking about feeding a quote unquote natural diet and we want it to come from some ingredients that are found in nature, a lot of them are very limiting. So we have to be very careful to make sure that our natural ingredients are actually providing the essentials we need them to provide. So then it comes down to looking at, you know, how do we put this all together into a diet? So there's ingredient, or there, sorry, there's variations in calorie intake that animals have. So we think about our basic nutrients and we think about energy as kind of two separate categories. And when we're looking at, let me see if I can get my pointer to work here. Laser pointer here. So if we're thinking about calories and variations in calorie intake, when you're looking at a commercial pet food that has a feeding guide on the package, what they've done is they've taken the calculated or expected energy requirement for whatever size dog or whatever size cat they're looking at, and they've calculated how many calories they expect that animal to need. The problem is that individual animals can vary up to 50%, so five zero above those calculations or below those calculations. And so energy requirements on a population basis form a bit of a bell curve. So we have some animals that have very low energy requirements and some animals that have very high energy requirements. And when we think about what that animal is eating, we need to make sure that within that calorie amount they're eating, they're getting all of those essential vitamins and minerals in. So we think about diet as a way to get essential nutrients in to help the body run efficiently. Um, and we need to make sure that the calories that are coming in are meeting that animal's needs. And again, this is true for, this is the, the dog chart on the left-hand side of this graph, and this is the cat chart. Um, cats have that same variation. So we need to think about not just the average dog, we need to think about the individual, not just the average cat, the individual cat. And so again, thinking about it from a commercial standpoint, commercial diet standpoint, is our how much food does our animal need? And are they meeting all of those essential nutrient requirements within that package, whatever form it takes? Um, and this is actually Yukon and Lily at the top of the screen here are two Goldens that I saw when I was at, at Red Bank. And they came to me because Lily and Yukon were eating the exact same amount of calories, but Lily here kept gaining weight and Yukon was stable, both of them were slightly over. So we have two different dogs that are about the same size and same weight, but they have very dramatically different calorie requirements. And so we have to think about dogs not as averages or not as generic, you know, generic animals. We need to think about them as individuals and making sure that we're meeting their individual nutrient and calorie needs. And so what does that mean when we're looking at commercial diets? So a little bit's gonna depend on what we mean by commercial diets or what we mean by diets in general. So I think of kind of traditional pet foods as being commercially prepared, canned, dry, semi-moist. So forms of diet that have been on the pet food market for 50 to 100 years. Dry kibble started after um, the, the technology to make a dry kibble for dogs and cats started after World War II. So it's really gained in popularity in the 50s and 60s. And, and even today, it's the most common and most popular form of feeding dogs. Um, canned foods were before that. So 19 teens, 1920s was when canning was really popular. And it was a lot of just canned meats for dogs and cats, not complete and balanced because they didn't understand nutrients uh, or understand all of the nutrient requirements. But these are foods and these are types of foods that have been available and been around and fed to groups of dogs and cats for generations and generations. What I think of as non-traditional diets are ones that are a little bit newer on the pet food market. So we don't have as much history, we don't have as much information, we don't have as much data points on 
what works and what doesn't work oftentimes. So those non-traditional diets can take the form of home prepared. So whether they're cooked or raw home prepared diets or sometimes commercial premixes where there's some kind of dehydrated vegetable and grain with vitamins and minerals that you add oils and, and meats to. Or if it's a commercial cooked, so a lot there's the fresh food diets have really exploded in popularity over the last probably 10 to 15 years. And so there's a lot more fresh food diet options and fresh food diet companies on the market now that are formulated to be complete and balanced, but again, relatively new on the pet food market. So we just don't know in terms of feeding large populations of dogs and cats, how well they work. Um, there's commercial raw diets that are out there. So foods that are not heat processed to cook um, that may either be frozen or dehydrated, freeze dried raw. And there's commercial grain free and exotic ingredients. And, and I'll revisit this a little bit at the end, um, but those commercial grain free diets, ones that have a lot of um, legumes, so things like peas and chickpeas and fava beans and pinto beans, or that have exotic meats like, like beaver and you know oxen or whatever it is, um, these are ingredients that are new to the pet food market. So I still consider them non-traditional. We don't know exactly how well they work at scale. So in large amounts, put through large extruded machines, extrusion machines, and fed to hundreds of thousands to millions of dogs. We just don't know how well they work. They may be absolutely fine. We just need a little bit more information, a little bit more data to make sure that we're supporting health and wellness. And so I think of this as, it's kind of epitomized by this picture here. And these two diets, the little bag of kibble and the glass container of the home cooked was actually diets for the same patient that I saw here um, at MASH here in LA. And the owner wanted to feed a combination of a commercial kibble and a home cooked. Uh, she had a busy morning. So she wanted something that was really easy and convenient for the morning. She can just put the kibble in the bowl and the dog would eat it kind of at its own leisurely pace. But then in the evenings, when she was done with work and had a little bit more time and was preparing her dinner, she wanted to have a meal that she could then, you know, prepare and feed so that the dog had this fresh food diet as she was eating her dinner with her family. So we did a combination. And I look at diets as, again, ingredients are ways to get the nutrients in. So you can do a combination of a traditional and a non-traditional diet, as long as we're meeting all of those basic needs and the animal, the individual is doing well with it. So if we want to think about kind of general pet foods, so how does this, how does this work on a, on a larger scale or individual scale even? So we have essential nutrients that are required, but there's a couple of, of books that are used by commercial entities and even by nutritionists like myself. So we've got the nutrient requirements for dogs, dogs and cats. Um, this is very similar to the recommended daily allowances or the RDAs for people, but this is the dog and cat version. And then we have AFCO, so the Association of American Feed Control Officials. And the difference between these two is this is a, a federal group that's looked at all of the available data, all of the available research and said, these are the minimum recommended intakes or potentially even maximum toxic levels of essential nutrients. And this is how what we recommend going into dog and cat foods. AFCO then takes that information and says, all right, for, for our more traditional kibble canned foods, we know we're getting a change in digestibility with the ingredients we use. So we're going to take NRC and we're going to build in a safety factor. We're also going to build in a factor for that normal variation. So I talked about that bell curve of nutrient intakes and in calorie intakes. And so we want to make sure that if we're feeding a population of dogs and cats that were meeting the, the broad category of animals were meeting their essential nutrient needs. So AFCO will have slightly higher recommended values than the NRC. So that's how we have our, our basic nutrients for dogs and cats. We then want to select our ingredients. And so if we're looking at a fresh food diet or a home cooked diet, we may be starting with very common, commonly um, found and readily recognizable ingredients like chicken, beef, rice, whatever. Um, if we're looking at a commercial dry food, so those extruded kibble pellets, we'll be looking at a lot of dry ingredients. So if you ever see chicken meal on an ingredient list, it's dehydrated, defatted chicken protein. So it's like a chicken protein powder. That's what this looks like. It just looks like this 
this tub right here on the far right. Um, egg will be powdered egg, ground wheat will be powdered wheat. This could be ground rice, this could be ground corn, it doesn't really matter. So think about dry kibble as if you're making a batch of cookies, you have these powdered ingredients that you mix together and then you emulsify with some liquid, some, some fat to make it into the texture. Um, I think most people, when you look at ingredients on the list, it sounds, you know, you'll see chicken meal. I think most people think about the picture on the package, which may be looking like chicken, but really this is what it looks like. It's, it's a brown powder. And then we put those ingredients into our diet. So again, whether we're looking at a fresh food style diet or a kibble diet, just depends on how it's being processed. But the path is the same no matter what the diet we're using. Some of the benefits of using a more traditional style commercial diet is again, these diets are gonna be formulated to be complete and balanced. Um, they're more economical, so you're using scale. So if it's a lot less expensive if you're buying things in bulk. So think about you know, shopping at Costco versus shopping at, at a, a specialty market, you know, shopping at the Acme or shopping at wherever. Um, so you've got some economies of scale to decrease the cost per batch. Um, I think about environmental sustainability too, which is something I think is often overlooked when we're thinking about commercial diets. These, these pet foods are using ingredients that are, you know, quote unquote, byproducts of the human food chain. Byproducts don't necessarily mean that they're better or worse. It just means these, these are ingredients that people don't want to eat. So it's a lot of liver, kidneys, you know, intestines cleaned of their contents. There's very specific definitions and rules and regulations about what can go into pet foods to make sure that it is nutritious, healthy, and safe. And again, I think about the environmental impact. If you had all of those organ meats and little bits of, of you know, ugly rice, that's what goes into brewer's rice, little bits of ugly things that we don't want to eat in our diet, if we didn't put them into pet foods, it would end up going into a landfill, it would get incinerated. And I think about you know, that's not very sustainable either. Um, convenience, it's a lot easier to have a package of something that's ready to go than having to source it every day. Um, it's portable, so especially with dry kibbles, if you travel with your dog or cat, if you're moving you know, to a new house, you're moving cross country, you, you wanna take a trip and have someone else come stay with your animals while you're away, it's very easy to give them directions on a commercial diet than give them directions on how to home cook or how you know what supplements to add in. Um, the other benefit of commercial, which is sometimes I think overlooked, is just consistent batch to batch. I have some dogs that need to eat the same combination of nutrients, the same fiber, the same water content every single meal of every single day, and any fluctuations will cause them to get diarrhea. So sometimes we have individuals where having just every bag being the same as every bag or every can being the same as every other can just works better for their digestive health. So again, always think comes back to the individual and what works for that individual. Some of the limitations of commercial diets though are that you are removed from the source. So you don't get to see the quality of the ingredients that come in. So you're really relying on the manufacturer's quality control, the manufacturer's integrity to make sure that they're following all of the, the rules that they should be following. Um, there can be some variability in the ingredients. So chicken meal um, or lamb meal or meat and bone meal, there's different qualities, just like with meats, there's grade A meats, there's you know, grade A eggs, triple A eggs. They, they all have slightly different quality donations and that sometimes that affects the nutrient contents of them too. So you may have some variability in the ingredients, you may have some variability in the final products that you can't control. The, the other limitation, and this is actually why a lot of patients end up in my exam room, is if you have an animal that has special medical needs that are not addressed by an existing commercial diet. So if they need to be on um, a diet that's kidney friendly, and they have a history of pancreatitis where it needs fat restriction, and they've got allergies to say, you know, corn or chicken, there are no commercial diets that meet those needs. And so we're looking at doing a home cooked diet or having some kind of a specialty food made. Um, pictures here. So again, my, my little demonstrations are, you know, this was Samantha. Samantha's a Bedlington that had a copper hepatopathy and food allergies. And so co with copper hepatopathies, this is a copper accumulation in the liver 
there's very few diets. There are two commercial diets that could work for her. Both of these commercial diets had ingredients that she didn't tolerate from an allergic skin disease standpoint. So we had to do a home cooked diet for her. Um, my little Pomeranian patient here is owned by a, a family that does a lot of traveling. And so they're going from into different countries. They go from, from New York to LA to London to Lebanon. And they have a hard time finding the same commercial diet at each place. So for that family, it's easier to do a home cooked diet because they know they can find, they know what ingredients they can find everywhere. Um, and so we need to make sure, you know, we're taking everything into account. And then this picture down, these two kitties at the bottom, um, the cat on the right is Simon. Um, and these two cats started off as completely black cats, but thinking about special needs and commercial diets not always meeting individual needs, is that Simon had um, a food allergic condition and he was changed to a diet that was not as digestible in a, as a protein source and caused him to become deficient in phenylalanine, which is an essential amino acid that's important for melanin production. So Simon here, even though his diet looked like it was complete and balanced, that particular manufacturer did not account for variations in nutrient requirements based on coat color. So he just needs to have a higher protein intake. He needs to have a higher intake of that essential amino acid to make sure that he looks as, as shiny, glossy black as his brother. So thinking about meeting all of our essential nutrient needs for basic dog or cat, but also for the individual um, and any limitations, accounting for any limitations we may have. Some of the things I think about from a you know, commercial diet standpoint is there are a few myths that surround them. Um, one of them is that the more you pay for food, the better quality it is. And I think of this, I'm, for thinking about like a true false dichotomy, I think these, this is really a false statement. Higher cost doesn't necessarily mean better quality. It could. There are some companies that put more money into ingredients. They put more money into manufacturing and testing and quality control. And that's all reflected on the final price, but pet food's still a big business. So there's a lot of companies that see the emotional connection that people have with their pets. Um, and they add a lot of extra stuff to the diet that's really not necessary to, to make people feel better about the food and also to be able to charge a little bit more. So I think of, you know, a lot of these diets have what I call feel good fillers. Um, things that people wouldn't think about as being fillers, but they really are. So things like dried carrots, dried blueberries, dried cranberries have little to no nutritional value in the diet. By the time you get put through and extruded, and this is for a dry pet food, by the time you go through that drying dehydration powdered process and then go through the machine to make the kibble, you've basically stripped all the phytonutrients out of it. So it allows you to put it on the label but it really doesn't do anything for the dog. If you actually want to have the benefits of these fruits and vegetables, you're, you're better off giving them fresh into the diet. So giving your dog blueberries, giving your cat shredded carrots, if that's what's important to you or the cat enjoys that. Um, but again, companies will put them on the label so that they can bump the price up a little bit. And a lot of this comes down to pet food marketing. And so one thing that has changed in the last 20 years is this recognition that people have an emotional connection with their dogs and cats. And there's a lot of really savvy marketers that have tapped into this and then use it to help promote foods for various conditions or promote foods to, to improve their profitability of their company. And so these were three studies that were actually published in marketing journals in um, kind of earlier 2000s where they recognize that people who spent more money on their dog food felt like they were being better parents. Um, they had this person, there's a birthday going on, so I don't, hopefully you can't hear that happy birthday song. <laughs> um, but they, they felt they, they had this recognition that owners had a perception of cost equals quality. And so this whole idea of premium foods and premiumization of foods is really more of a marketing trend rather than a nutritional trend. So when companies say, or when a, a marketing company promotes something as a premium diet, um, that doesn't actually have a nutritional definition. Premium just means that people are willing to pay more for it. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a better quality. And so the one thing, not, not that I want to 
Jade, all of my clients, is to recognize that pet food is a big marketplace. So these are global pet food sales up to 2019. So 93.9 billion dollars with a B um, in US dollars global market. If you have a company that has 0.1% of a market share, you're still making millions and millions of dollars every year. And so a lot of this drive, this from the early 2000s, 2010 to 2020, is really been this premium, premium idea, this premiumization and this, this market drive to really tap into owners and people's emotional connections with their pets. So one of the challenges for pet owners is try to sift through all of that and, and see where am I being marketed to and where am I being given actual information that'll help me make good decisions for my pet. Um, well, kind of on the flip side of that, you know, the idea that if you pay more for your diet, that it's gonna be better. Um, the flip side of that is some people who think that all diets are the same. So it doesn't really matter as long as it's complete and balanced, feed them whatever works, which is sort of true and sort of false. So Yes, if you're feeding a complete diet, you're meeting all of those basic nutrient needs. But again, thinking about that individual variation, um, food is a way to get nutrients in. The food you select may have a different digestibility. So digestibility is just how much of what you feed gets absorbed by the body versus comes out as poop. Um, it may have differences in ingredient lists. So there might be certain ingredients on there that your dog or cat does not tolerate. Um, there may be variable quality control between those brands. And so, yes, all foods are complete and balanced, but we still want to pick the diet that's going to meet your individual dog or cat's needs. And so we're, let's look at, at kind of looking at a pet food label to see if we can figure out, you know, good versus bad or, or red flags or not. So this is actually a label from there's a local pet store here that um, the owner fancies himself as a nutritionist, even though he's not, um, but he's, he's again recognized this emotional connection that people have and, and these fresh food diets are becoming trendy. So he's gonna make his own fresh food diet. Um, there's a couple of requirements, legal requirements on labels. Pet food labels have to state a species designation. You have to say whether it's for a dog or for a cat. If it does not have that species designation, and it can say both, it can say for dogs and cats, as long as it meets the nutrient needs for both, but it needs to say who it's supposed to be for. Um, so this particular diet has a little dog in a chef's hat, um, which most people would think would be for feeding to a dog, but this was actually a diet that he recommended feeding to two cats in a household. So we don't have a species de designation, looks like dog, but it was being recommended for cats. We also need to have on the label, we need to have calories. It's required by law to have a calorie statement. And if we look at the label, we've got handling instructions, we've got recommended feeding instructions, the guaranteed analysis, ingredients, no calories on there anywhere. Um, and this was the only label on the container. It was one of those kind of clear, like takeout food containers, no other packaging there. So we're missing calories on here. The diets themselves also have to state whether they are complete and balanced for adult cat maintenance, adult dog maintenance, all life stages, whatever, or they need to have a feeding statement that says it is for intermittent or supplemental feeding only. So you can use it as a treat, you can use it as a topper, but it should not be used as a complete diet or fed like every day as the only thing. So this diet doesn't have that feeding statement on there. Um, it needs to have a unit amount. So you need to have how many ounces, how many grams, how many you know, pounds of food in the bag. Um, this one has a net weight. So yes, legally you need to have net weight, but it should have a number associated with it. And so we can see it just says net weight. Um, diets, especially fresh food diets should always have a use by date. So it should have, when was the diet made? How long is it good for? Not just once it's been opened, how long, you know, how long do you have to use it? You need to have specific dates to know when does that food go bad and you shouldn't feed it. Um, one of the other requirements for commercial foods is you need to know where and who made it. So it needs to have some kind of designation that has been, you know, manufactured for, you know, Dr. Weeds Pet Nutrition, or it needs to say manufactured by Dr. Weeds Pet Nutrition. Um, and it needs to have a specific, like in Los Angeles, California. I don't have a pet nutrition line, <laughs> but 
if I did, I would need to state where I made it and that I'm the one who's making it or I'm having somebody else make it for me. So these are the things we want to look for on a label. So if you do go into a pet store and there's a new brand that you don't, you've not seen before, or you go to a farmer's market or, you know, some kind of fair and somebody's selling their special formula of dog food, we still need to make sure that it's meeting legal label requirements. Because in my opinion, if a company doesn't know what legally should or should not go on a label, how do we have any confidence that they know what should and should not go into that pet food? So if you can't figure out labels, you probably can't figure out the pet food either. And so that's kind of, a, for me, a red flag. Some of the other things that you may see on a label um, and you know, being in a different language, I'm not too worried about that as long as we've got the, the you know, different the, um, translation so we know what we're reading, as long as you can read, read and understand what it is. But there are a couple of things that should be spelled correctly. So American Association of Feed Control Officials, so AAFCO. Um, so if a company can't get the acronym right, probably a red flag. Um, the other thing I look at is who's distributing it or making it. And so I, I mean, Discount Perfumes Inc. may be fine for perfumes. I don't know what they know about pet foods. And so for me, I would be a little bit concerned or a little bit skeptical for if a company that has no other interest in pet food or human food manufacturing, storage, distribution, whatever, is now jumping into the pet food market because we don't, it, it's a, they're very different markets. We're feeding something for long-term health and wellness. This is the only diet that some people may feed to their dog or cat for every meal of every day for months to years on end. We want to make sure there's nothing in there that's going to be harmful. So some of the other things to look at on a list are things that are not potentially on the list. And so if I have an, an individual animal that has an allergy to something, if they're allergic to say chicken or they're allergic to beef or dairy or corn or whatever, um, it's important to know that with over-the-counter pet foods that cross-contamination can occur. And this is just normal manufacturing practices these are all made in large, manu large manufacturing plants where they make a lot of different foods and handle a lot of different ingredients. And so you can always have little bits of, of cross-contamination. I think of this as if your family member has a peanut allergy, you're looking for what else is made in that plant. Not necessarily what they're intentionally putting in, but what could accidentally get in that could make that individual sick. So think of that the same for animals with with documented food allergies is we need to be very careful about what else could be getting into that food that could potentially make them sick. And there have been a lot of studies where, you know, different nutritionists, different internists across the US, Canada, and Europe, just go to a pet store and randomly buy a bunch of different examples of foods and then test them for DNA to see what else is in there. And they always find little bits of proteins that aren't on the label. Um, then we also have to think about, again, going back to this is all, there's a lot of marketing in pet foods. And so there was a lawsuit um, seven years ago that was settled out of court for a premium price pet food company that was claiming they weren't putting byproducts, they weren't putting certain, certain ingredients that they were labeling as, you know, quote unquote, bad ingredients in their diets, when in fact they were most likely because they're less expensive and easier and they know that they're nutritious and fine. Um, but they were claiming they didn't use these lower cost ingredients when in fact they were. Um, there's also, there have been a couple of recalls for pentobarbital contamination about five years ago and, and pentobarbital is euthanasia solution should 100% never, never, never be found in pet foods. And what happened was this particular company was sourcing meats that, that were not fit for consumption that also included euthanized horse. And so they were in, in, you know, they claim it was accidental, it was their manufacturer or their, their raw material provider. But again, it goes back to accountability and companies should be testing their raw materials and making sure that when they order a product, it's really what's being delivered and that there's not some um, either contamination or some substitutions that have happened without their knowledge. Um, we've also seen that with hyperthyroidism, which hyperthyroidism is a more common condition in cats, but in dogs, almost always considered iatrogenic, which means that we've caused it as humans. 
And it's most often from either overdosing a thyroid medication or from um, feeding meats that are contaminated with thyroid tissue. And so we have to think about making sure again that the companies know what they're doing because if they do it wrong it could potentially cause harm in our dogs and cats and then the last thing to to just kind of keep on people's minds is we're still seeing cases of diet induced cardiomyopathy in dogs fed certain premium marketed diets that are either grain free usually grain free being high legumes so peas chickpeas different lentils or that are boutique foods, so made in, in by smaller companies that may not have done all of their due diligence in terms of ingredient sourcing and formulation and manufacturing. And so we don't have, unfortunately, have a specific cause for these diet-induced cardiomyopathy cases, other than there are some commonalities with diet, and we're still seeing it. I actually saw one just last week. One of my patients last week was a two, it is a two and a half year old. Um, pit bull mix that was diagnosed two months ago with DCM, this dilated cardiomyopathy, had been completely normal six months prior to that, and then went in for just screening before it because it fractured one of its teeth and needed to have the tooth extracted. They heard a murmur, sent it to the cardiologist, DCM. So we're still seeing cases. It's not something that's made up by pet food marketers. It's not something that's been made up by people at universities. These are actual cases that are happening. The problem is we just don't have a one specific cause that we can point to for all of these cases to identify what the issue is. So it's hard to fix if we can't figure out what the problem is. But we need to think about, again, health and wellness is our focus. So we want to make sure that our base diet is not causing any problems the dog or cat didn't already have. All right. So the last little bit of this is looking at ways to keep dogs and cats healthy. So nutrition rule number one, making sure that we know what our calorie requirements are for our dogs and cats. So this is that graph again, looking at expected versus actual energy requirements for dogs and cats. So most dogs fall pretty darn close to expected. So 100% of what their expected intake should be. Same with cats, pretty close to 100% of what their expected intake should be. But there is a little bit of variation plus minus. And so we need to keep that variation in mind. If we're feeding a dog according to the package recommendations and they're losing weight, we just need to feed them more. If we're feeding them according to the package recommendations and they're gaining weight, we just feed them less. And where we can start to run into issues is if we're feeding them so much less that they're not getting enough of the essential nutrients from that diet, that's when we may need to add supplements or we may need to use a therapeutic diet that has just higher levels of vitamins and minerals in it inherently. Same with cats. Most of our cats, I would say, fall on the left side of this curve. So they're easy keepers. You feed them according to the package recommendations and they balloon up um, and you have to keep cutting them back, cutting them back. Um, sometimes it has to do with the energy density of the food. So some of these foods can be have a lot of calories per cup, so you don't need to feed them very much. But again, we always have to think about feeding them to meet their basic nutrient needs and making sure they're staying at a good body weight because obesity is a health risk for both dogs and cats. Um, a lot of surveys that have looked at obesity rates over the years estimate that about 40% of all cats and about a third, so 34, 35% of all dogs. I, my, my assessment is for cats, it's probably underestimating. I think a lot of people look at over slightly overweight cats and they think that they're ideal when really they're a little bit heavy. So I think it's probably underreporting. Um, it's hard, especially for dogs to separate hunger versus appetite. Same thing for people. You know, you're hungry. If you don't get enough calories, you feel hungry. But if you see a food that's really palatable that you know you enjoy, you're gonna wanna eat that even if you've already had enough calories. You know, so one of my big weaknesses is French fries. I will eat an entire bowl of French fries or plate of French fries on my own, even though it's twice as many calories as I need because I like the taste. Your dogs and cats are the same with their favorite treats. And so if you have a really tasty treat that they have ready access to or they keep coming back and they, and they keep asking you and nudging you for more, it's very easy to overindulge that. And so we kind of have to separate out the attention seeking behaviors and the positive food rewards and when they just want attention and to kind of play ball or go for a walk or somehow distract them with something that's 
not going to add extra calories um, because it is a health risk for them. We think about long-term health. For cats, we worry about diabetes and increasing the risk of diabetes if they're overweight. Um, we know in dogs that being obese can decrease lifespan by up to two years, uh, impacts joints, heart health, can help, can affect medication levels that are needed. So it's not just a cosmetic effect. It can have a negative impact on health and wellness over time. And so again, I'm thinking about long-term, I want my patients and my you know dogs and cats to be with people for as long as we possibly can. And so we kind of have to linking about, you know, are we feeding, are we overfeeding, underfeeding, or just right feeding? So um, again, we're feeding for a body condition. So we want to make sure that our, you know, for our dogs, we're somewhere around a four to five on a nine point scale. So we can feel the ribs without having to push down too much. We can see a little bit of a waist and a tuck. Um, when they're viewed from the top or viewed from the side. Most dogs, as they start to gain weight, start to get a little bit thicker. So they start to become like little tubes. Um, if they're underweight, we can see the ribs just, they're more prominent. So we shouldn't be able to see the ribs, um, just the dogs kind of sitting there. Some dogs that are very lean, if they're closer to a five, when they're breathing, you can kind of get a hint of ribs as they're breathing in and out, or if they have a really short, sleek coat, you'll see ribs. Sight hounds tend to be a little bit ribbier than other breeds as well. So that can be normal, just breed confirmation, but we shouldn't be able to see like really prominent spine, the top of the spine. We shouldn't be able to see the hip bone sticking out. Um, so that would be too thin. And if we think about kind of what's ideal versus heavy, these are um, side-by-side -side Labradors from the Purina Lifespan study that was published in um, late 90s into the early 2000s where they actually did paired feedings between siblings. Same exact food, the only difference was how much they fed. So one dog was allowed to eat as much as they wanted until they gained about 15 to 20% over their ideal. And the other one was restricted to 75% of what its litter mate ate. So same diet, just 25% less food. And so this is a, a Labrador with a five. Most of my Labradors sit like, you know, patients sit about here. Most people look at Labradors and they would say this is too thin. You can see the edge of the rib, but really that's normal weight. Um, the AKC, when they do the, the, all the dog shows and they show like the, the prim, prime examples of labs, they're always a little bit heavy. So it kind of kills me a little bit as a nutritionist. Um, but you also have to kind of skew your breed standard to be more ideal body weight again. Um, and we can see the same thing for cats. So we want a cat that's a five out of nine is ideal body weight. You can feel ribs without having to, you won't see them. You don't have to push down too much. I would say most of our companion cats are probably in the six to seven range. Uh, every so often I'll get a patient that's a really just lean, eats exactly what they need. Um, but this is, this is our ideal cat here. Um, and this is actually the cat I showed you, Simon, um, that was the, the brownish collar. This was him after changing his diet, but he's also a good, he lost a little bit of weight. So it's a good comparison between his brother, who's just kind of this big roll, like his little head up here and he looks like a little tick versus the cat who looks more like cat shaped. And again, this is just looking at feeding for body condition. So this is one of the patients that I worked with when I was in New Jersey. Um, Rhodesian Ridgeback sh should look like this specimen over here on the left. This is what my patient looked like, kind of this little tube dog. He almost lost his little um, Ridgeback Ridge. All right, um, this one, I don't know why this, this uh, slide is being funny, but this is looking at optimal intake. So we looked at calories. Um, and looking at our nutrient requirements. So hopefully the videos will work. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how to take the pointer off so I can play the video. I apologize. I don't know why this slide got... Michelle, do you know how to take the, the dot off now? I think down where you are, Kim, Kimberly, I think Kimberly knows. Um, yeah, I think you're doing there, the right thing. Yeah. When you click on that, does it allow you to select pull it up? or when you click on it? It doesn't. Hmm. 
maybe pointer on. Uh, there you, there you go. Um, I think I turn off. Okay, there we go. So sorry about that. It, it, it was working in the preview, and now it's not working for me. But hopefully, the videos will work. So this is a slide looking at just making sure we're getting optimal nutrient intakes. And so these are two videos of the same puppy. It's this Penny Lemon who was brought in as a stray puppy into to MASH emergency, and one of our emergency doctors took her in. Um, so this is her walking around right now, or when she first brought in. So this is very classic for rickets in a puppy. So calcium vitamin D deficiency, what happens is the bones start to bow instead of growing straight because they don't have the, the, the mineral inten integrity to them. And so this is what vitamin D and calcium deficiency look like in a growing puppy. Um, Penny Lemon, we don't know what her diet was. She was just brought in as a stray puppy off the street. Um, so we just changed her to a puppy food, small bites puppy food, because she's a small puppy. And this is her three weeks later. Hmm. So still a little bow legged, but bouncing around. She's not tiring out. She wants to keep going before she just, she walk a few steps and she's like, I'm done. I, I need to stop now. Uh, so we need to think about again, not just meeting basic needs, but making sure we're getting all the essential nutrients in. Um, which takes me to home cooking. I think I'm gonna go a little bit over time. Sorry, I'm talking too much, um, but it's okay. It's okay. As long as it's okay with you, I think we're fine to stay. People can drop out if they need to. And I'll still, I'm happy to stay late and, and answer questions. So that's not going to impact question time. Um, but for looking at different ways of feeding, we talked about commercial foods and making sure we're getting all of the complete and balanced nutrients in and the benefits of feeding a, a commercial complete diet. But again, it doesn't work for everybody. And there are certain conditions and certain situations where feeding a home prepared diet may be the best option for both the dog or cat, or potentially the owners. And so some of the benefits that we see with a home-cooked diet is they do tend to be palatable to dogs and cats, um, more digestible. We can control the ingredients. We know exactly what foods are going in, especially if we're dealing with allergy situations. We do have that, um, it reinforces that bond we have with our dogs and cats. And so preparing the food and spending the time um, you know, they get excited when you're cooking the food, you're happy to see them enjoy their meals. And so it just helps enhance that relationship. The negative sides of home cooking is it does cost time and money. So now you're going to have to make sure that you're allotting for an hour or two every week to batch cook or potentially, you know, half hour to an hour every day to prepare the food. And it does cost more in terms of, of monetary cost than a commercial diet you have to think about supplements you have to think about all these other things that you don't normally think about still have to go in um, for some people it does require a lifestyle change so if you don't normally cook for yourself or cook for your family cooking for your dog especially if you've got a young dog who's only like a year and a half or two years who may live to be 12 or 14 you're going to have to think about that for the next 10 to 12 years you're going to need to plan for meals for this individual i'll tell you i have um, my kids are now teenagers and I looked forward to the day when they can prepare their own foods and I didn't, they weren't completely relying on me for everything. But if you're doing a home cooked diet, that dog or cat is relying on you for everything. And you can't just open the bag when you're tired. One of the other downsides with home cooked diets is we get, in, we can get into a situation called diet drift where the diet starts off as complete and balanced. We've got the vitamin, mineral supplements, the essential fatty acids all blended in the right amount, but you run out of an ingredient and you may not replace it right away. And then you get three months down the road and you didn't notice any change when the calcium supplement was left out. So did I really need it anyway? Um, and so oftentimes clients will start to leave things out or they'll shift ingredients. I got tired of buying chicken, the price went up. So I switched to turkey or I switched to beef or whatever. Um, and all of those little changes affect the nutrient balance in the diet and can take a diet that started off as complete and make it into incomplete. Um, so we need to think about all of that. Um, we need to make sure that the animal can't pick out what it likes. So if it's a dog with kidney disease and it only picks out the chicken or the beef, we've got a problem. Um, if it's a cat who doesn't like fresh foods because it's only eaten dry food for its entire life, we might have a problem too. And then just the food safety aspects of it. 
And then, so that kind of takes me to, this is a recipe that one of my clients found online and just wanted to know if this, this would work for her dog. So interested in feeding a home cooked diet for her companion dog and will something like this work? This is a very typical recipe. I would not recommend copying this unless this is something you're gonna use as a treat because there's a lot of issues that I have with it. So we've got brown rice, water, potato, carrot, celery, ground beef, eggs. For the most part, those are all pretty straightforward. Your brown rice, dried brown rice is gonna be the same no matter where you buy it or who makes it. But beef is my sticking point because there's a lot of different types of ground beef there's 80% lean, 70% lean, 90% lean, 99% or 95% lean. And so depending on the fat content that you buy, it's going to dramatically change the calorie composition and the nutrient composition of this particular food. So when you have things that are very vague like this or have recipes that are vague, it leaves too much open to interpretation. And if you interpret it the wrong way, you could run into problems. So I looked at this diet, I, I figured it was six pounds, you're probably buying the 80-20 because you can buy it in either three pound or five pound increments. And so this is the diet profile, the macronutrient profile with, with a 80% um, lean turkey. So about 23% of the calories come from protein, 60% from fat and the rest from carbohydrates. Calories per muffin, about 292, very, you know, very close to what would be in like a one cup of a dry kibble or, um, you know, two thirds of a can of food. So pretty comparable to a main meal, um, assuming you're feeding this particular type of beef. The problem is this was the sum total of the ingredient recommendations. There wasn't any vitamin mineral supplement other than the dash of salt. And so if we look at the nutrient profile, of this diet. Now this is looking at these individual ingredients from the USDA database and then comparing them with dog nutrient requirements. On this profile, green bars are good. The percentage here is percentage according to compared with AFCO requirements. So if you're looking at a commercial dry or canned or fresh food diet formulated AFCO, this is where we are. Um, but we can see even with six pounds of beef, one of our essential amino acids is too low. Number of our vitamins and minerals are too low. Even our iron, people think of, of red meats being a great iron source, but there's so much fat coming in relative to the protein that we're still not getting enough of these minerals in. So short term, a meal or two as a special treat on a you know, birthday or holiday, not gonna be the end of the world, assuming he can handle or she can handle that much fat. But if this was the only diet being fed long-term, we can run into some significant nutrient deficiencies, but it's gonna take a few months to maybe even a year before you notice it. And by that time, most people don't associate it with the diet. They think something else has changed and it really comes back to the nutrients not being right. And so we also you know, need to think about it, you know, doing no harm when, you, when we make our diet decisions. So this is a, another example of, this was a cat, um, a, actually a group of kittens that were seen during my residency time at Davis. So this is an older case, but this is one that has very good x-rays on. Um, so it was a group of nine week old kittens that were brought in. So this one was a, in particular was a, a nine week old male kitten was seen by his regular veterinarian for a suspected infectious disease. So the, the, the kittens weren't walking very well. They were unstable. They were reluctant to move and jump. And so we're thinking about some kind of infectious disease that was affecting the central nervous system or the peripheral nerves. They were, cats had gone through like parasite checks and all of this. They're trying to think about what could these, this litter of kittens been exposed to because they did come from an area shelter three weeks before. And so we're, we're immediately thinking infectious disease. When the owner, the, the, the foster was questioned, turned out that the foster had switched the kittens based on what she perceived was going to be a healthy natural diet for these kittens. So raw meat, alternating between different chicken, turkey, beef, kind of alternating back and forth, some pork, some fish, and fresh seasonal produce. So went to the farmer's market, whatever was in season, started blending it in with the, the meat these cats were eating. Cats ate it very well. They loved the food. The problem is on x-rays, we can see why the kitten's not jumping very well. So this is a pathologic folding fracture in the long bone of the left leg. 
you can't see the rest of the bones. So normally you should be able to see the spine, the vertebrae and the ribs very clearly. You kind of lose that. They're almost like ghost bones in there. So there's so little mineral density that these bones just don't have any integrity and they just fold and break. Um, so again, this is, this is what, if we had taken an x-ray of Penny Lemon, the little dog who had a hard time walking, this is probably pretty close to what her bones would have looked like, kind of bowing very thin, not enough calcium, not enough vitamin D. The only difference that was made to these kittens was changing them to just kitten food. So Foster was told, go to the grocery store. You don't have to spend a lot of money. Just pick a kitten food that's complete and balanced and let's recheck in six weeks. So same kitten six weeks later. This is what an x-ray should look like on a cat or dog. We should be able to see the bone. So in, on an x-ray, bones should be very dense white and block the beam from hitting the x-ray. So this is air here. This is all the, our soft tissue structures. And so here's that fracture that's healed after six weeks, no fixation, no other treatment, just changing diet and allowing the bones to heal and remodel. And so if you need a comparison reminder, here's our original x-ray six weeks before to six weeks later. We can also see where some of our other breaks happen now because we can see the pelvis. So we can see there's a little bit of a, of a bow here and here. Um, the cat is pretty straight on there. So some you know, we think like maybe he's twisted, maybe he's not in the right position, but these are actually, he had three other pelvic fractures that were healing um, on this image, not to mention a few other, other spots here that were starting to bend that were healing as well. So only changes made, making sure we're getting a complete diet. Um, the last little bit I have is on raw foods because I'll get a lot of questions on raw meat diets and kind of thinking back and, and hearkening back to this natural style diet. You know, dogs in nature don't cook their food, they eat their prey, their fresh kill raw. Um, why can't I feed raw meat to my dog? Um, I would argue that the fresh kill that they're eating is fresh kill. So it's not been, it's not gone through a meat packing plan. It's not been packaged and sit on the shelf and sit in a refrigerated case. And so it's not actually like we're feeding raw meats that we buy at the store. It's not as fresh as a dog would get in nature, most likely. Um, and we don't have any control of the processing. So that me, the concern would be contamination with bacteria parasites that we can't see on the outside that get killed with cooking. So the benefit of heat processing for our own foods is it kills pathogens and it makes the food safer to eat. Sometimes cooking, especially when we're thinking about grains like rolled oats or rice or potato, cooking makes them more digestible. And so cooking unlocks the nutrient potential of certain ingredients and potentially can negatively impact others, but it has a net benefit effect. So all of the benefits that we get from a fresh food diet we still get those benefits if the meats are cooked versus raw. It's still palatable. You still control the ingredients. You still know exactly what you're feeding, but we've just taken out the, the health risks aspect of it. And there's actually been a, quite a few studies. There was a new study that just came out this week looking at um, bacterial transmission between dogs eating raw meat and the people in the household and actually identifying the bacteria in the people. So one of them was that it was a study that went, came out of the UK where there's a lot of raw meat feeding there and they found um, E. coli urinary tract infections that were typed to the bacteria the dog was shedding and was in the food. So it's, it's all of these unintended consequences that we think about, you know, our dogs are eating raw meat, they're ingesting the food, they may not get sick from it, you may not even notice that they're passing salmonella because they're not having diarrhea, they're not having issue, but it's a source of contamination for the household. So I think about we're feeding our dogs, we're feeding our cats, but they're living in households with people. And so they're licking the baby, they're licking grandma, they're licking you, they're licking their butts, they're <laughs> going outside, walking, traipsing through the yard, traipsing through poop, look, chewing on their paws. It's just, it gets everywhere. So to try to minimize and reduce the risk um, for pets and people is what my, my goal and my focus is. And I tell people, this is a, a quote from a, an infectious disease specialist, a veterinary infectious disease specialist out of the University of Guelph up in Canada, 
who's done a lot of work looking at raw meats and raw meat feeding is that, you know, and I completely agree with the statement. So I'm not anti-raw, I'm anti-disease. So I want to make sure that we're feeding diets that are healthy, nutritious, that are supporting health and wellness and making sure that your dogs and cats are staying in your households and living in your households as long as we possibly can. So that's, that's kind of my focus. To me, it doesn't matter what kind of diet, where it comes from, where you buy it, how much you pay for it, as long as it's healthy for that individual. So some of the challenges when we're looking at diets is there's a lot of marketing claims out there and we have very little evidence to support or dismiss the claims. Um, but I always like to remind people that marketing claims oftentimes seem reasonable at the time. And we can look at some old ads for human products that haven't held held up. You know, if we, you know, the, the test of time has not been good. You know, we don't give our children cocaine drops to help with their toothaches anymore. We don't recommend starting cola earlier, you know, in life, like it's like it's baby formula, like it's some amazing elixir of life. So there are certain marketing trends and certain marketing claims or therapeutic claims that we know may have some negative consequences. And so we always have to think back, like, is this really the best thing? Don't feed soda pop to your babies. Don't give your children cocaine tooth drops. Don't give your dogs, <laughs> you know, any kind of ingredient that may be harmful to them. Um, because again, health and wellness is our focus. So kind of take home messages is, we need to make sure that whatever diet you choose, you're familiar with the company. So know the company, who's making it, how they're making it. Um, ask some questions. The, the World Small Animal Veterinary Association, so Wasava, has some great toolkits I can share with, um, with our hosts to provide as well that look at how to, kind of what kinds of questions you should ask your pet food manufacturer to make sure that they are looking at quality control and ingredient stability, all of that. Um, we need to make sure the diet's complete and balanced. And at the end of the day, there is no one perfect diet or brand. Everything has to be matched. So we want to match diet and dog, diet and cat. So how does your individual animal do on it? Everything going in and out normally. So eating, drinking, peeing, pooping normally, good activity level, nice shiny coat. You know, we want to see that nice little glossy black coat. Um, we want to see them looking robust and healthy. And if you have a diet that is being, you're, you're being told is the best diet ever, but your dog is blowing its coat all the time or having chronic diarrhea and you're in the vet's office starting them on metronidazole every other month, then that's not a good diet match for that individual. And with that, I apologize for going over time a little bit. Um, I do like to talk about diet. It's hard for me to figure out what to cut and what to include. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions at the end of the day. Hopefully I didn't leave you too drained, emotionally drained like my kids when they were young here. And that, no, that was wonderful. Um, we're getting, it's so comprehensive. Um, and I appreciate you staying late for questions because we do have a bunch of them. Um, so I will get to as many as we can. Um, okay, so the first, um, just because we were just talking about raw, um, we did have a question about freeze-dried food. Um, does that solve the issues with, with raw? It depends a little bit. So it depends on the company. So some companies will do freeze-drying where it literally is just in a giant freeze-dry oven that extracts the water from it. Some companies do that and a process called high-pressure pasteurization, so HPP. Um, Drying will decrease bacterial and mold activity, but it doesn't kill ones that are already there. So doing the high pressure pasteurization, basically what the companies have done is they use pressure as a kill step rather than heat. And it's a very common way to process human foods too. So anytime you buy like a prepackaged salsa, anything that you buy that's in a plastic container with a seal on it, those can't go through a, a standard heat processing because it'll melt the plastic. They go through HPP. So those are food safe. And there's a couple of companies that, a couple of raw food manufacturers that do HPP for all of their diets. I have zero concern for those. Or maybe not zero, maybe like 1% concern like I would for any other like dry food. Like there could always have contaminations happen, but it's a lot less likely when they do HPP. 
Great. Okay. Um, and in terms of the contamination, I guess you watch for recalls. Um, we have a recall uh, page on our website. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, I, I just one thing I want to say about recalls, and, and I saw someone ask me, what are those companies? I would go to mm -hmm. the company manufacturing websites and look for that information because companies that do HPP will tell you all about it and they'll tell you all about their safety, their food safety. Um, recalls up until 2007, when the melamine and cyanuric acid contamination happened, pet food recalls were considered voluntary. So just the last 15 years have pet food companies been required by the, the US government to issue recalls. Before that, Companies could decide if they wanted to recall it and, and bring foods in or quietly fix the problem on their own. So companies that say we've been around for 25 years and we haven't had a recall are being a little bit disingenuous because recalls weren't required until more recently. And it wasn't enforced for pet foods until the last like 10 years. So the first wow. five years, they had this kind of like flexible window where they didn't have to comply. Now they have to comply. Wow. Okay. Um, that's good to know. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the the pet food shortage um, that mm -hmm. I know many people are experiencing. Because is it better to keep your dog on the same food, and then what do you do in the event of the shortage? Yeah. I mean, I, it's hard. It's a, it's a tough call. So you know, if you have a diet that you know your dog or cat does really well on. Um, like my cats have been eating the same, I have cats that have special needs. They've been eating the same food like all day, every day for years. And so when that food is unavailable, it's really stress inducing <laughs> because mm -hmm. there is nothing that's a good match. So then I'm having to find like, what's my, my backup second best. Um, if you have a healthy animal, I think having two or even three diets that you can, that are similar. So they're all chicken and rice varieties, but maybe three different brands that you can substitute and swap out kind of intermittently just to make sure, you know, if there is a recall or if there is a, a, a you know, manufacturing back order, you've got something else you can go to without panicking. Great. Um, that's great advice. Um, let's see, how about, um, how common are food allergies? Um, I'm going to ask another question. My, I just got a 10% battery session to plug my laptop. Okay, in. go ahead. Go ahead. No problem. I just don't want to be midway through a question and have to lose everything. <laughs> okay, no, thank you. Um, so allergies themselves, food allergies are pretty uncommon, actually. Um, more common dogs and cats will have environmental allergies, so they'll be atopic. So things like dust mites, storage mites, pollens, danders. Dogs can be allergic to human dander as well. Um, my personal dog is mildly allergic to human dander, so she's on immunotherapy because <laughs> life in our house is tough for her. Um, <laughs> it, so that the environmental triggers are a lot more common than food. Food does happen, but I when I worry about food allergies, it's usually dogs and cats that have both gastrointestinal and skin signs. So you know it can just be skin, but oftentimes we see a GI component to it as well. Um, the only way to diagnose a food allergy, though, is to do an elimination and challenge trial. There's a lot of companies that will gladly take your, you know, one to three hundred dollars and give you a list of ingredients that they say your dog or cat is sensitive to. The problem is those are very unreliable, a lot of false positives. So they'll give you like 10 different ingredients and your dog may have only been exposed to two of them. So the only way to get an allergy is to have prior exposure. So the, the question on how common they are is hard because a lot of the studies we have have been done in different countries. And it's usually like one to 5% mm -hmm. of dogs presenting for itching actually have a food trigger behind it. Wow. Yeah. And then I think people think it's much more than that, right? But yeah, yeah. it is. And it's usually, it's uh -huh. usually something else in their environment that's causing mm -hmm. it. Or like, or if a food intolerance or something, right? That's like different yeah. than, than, okay, than the allergy. Yeah. yeah um, and you think about digestibility and if you have a food that's not very digestible, it's going to cause diarrhea in that dog, but it's not the chicken, corn, barley, whatever. It's the fact that it's not very digestible. And so it's causing the bacteria to go haywire in the gut. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. If you were using a good commercial dog food or cat food, do you need to give supplements? 
Probably not. It depends on which supplements we're talking about. So in terms of essential nutrients, you don't need things like pet tabs or NuVet or anything like that because that diet has all the vitamins and minerals, all the essential vitamins and minerals. Now, supplements that may vary and, and nutrient requirements that may vary between individuals are things like fatty acids. So a lot of, especially dry foods, may not have high enough levels of those essential fatty acids for long-coated dogs and cats. And so adding a, you know, a flaxseed oil or powder, or adding some kind of oil source may actually help with skin and coat because your dog or cat's requirement is higher. So it depends on what we're talking about. So potentially skin and coat issues, you may want to add on top of a, even a good quality commercial food. Um, things like fish oils are usually pretty low in commercial diets. So if you've got a dog with arthritis or whatever, you might want to add that on separately. Okay, great. Um, we have some questions about making an appointment with a, with a nutritionist. And I guess at what point do you need to do that? And how do you find a, a good one? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, so when to make an appointment with a nutritionist, I don't think there is any like right or wrong answer. I have clients that seek me out because they've, you know, I've adopted a new puppy and I just, am, I'm overwhelmed. And so sometimes my hour, I do hour long appointments with clients. And sometimes we're just talking about how to walk down the aisle and figure out what's the best match mm -hmm. or, you know, dispelling myths and, and concerns or talking about their missing, you know, their concerns. Um, sometimes we have situations where, again, there is no commercial option. So I think, you know, anyone who has just a lot of questions about diet and wants to have that more one-on-one -on, -one on how does, how do I pick the right combination for these individual dogs and cats, um, could be helped by a nutrition consult. Um, some GPs are pretty good at that too. So I'd always start mm -hmm. with a general practitioner and ask mm -hmm. them, um, but then if you have an animal that is having, you know, chronic skin issues, chronic gastrointestinal issues, or has been diagnosed with a chronic disease like kidney disease or like recurrent pancreatitis, I think having a nutritionist kind of sit down and look at all, all of the information and give you some tools to use for treats, for feeding, for monitoring going forward can be very helpful. Um, I feel like a lot of the time I spend with my consults is really just going through disease states and explaining like, what is kidney disease? What is IBD? Why does it change what you need to feed your animal? Great. Okay. Um, and we will send out a list tomorrow, not necessarily of names, but of an association where, where people can, can yeah. find someone. Yeah. And um, then where to, where yeah. to find nutritionists. So the yeah. nutrition college merged with the internal medicine college recently. So right. it used to be ACVN, so the American College of Veterinary Nutrition. Now that like kind of, if you go to acvn.org, it'll funnel you to the Internal Medicine College for the nutrition there. There is a list of nutritionists that see patients in practice. Um, there are some in the, so AMC unfortunately doesn't have one, yeah. shouldn't have a nutritionist for sure. Um, but um, Oradell has one, Cornell, um, the veterinary school on Long Island has a nutritionist. I just don't know if he's seen patients just yet. So there are a few kind of scattered around. Um, and there's a lot of individuals that will do telemedicine consults too. So if you have, um, if you, if you have need of a nutritionist, but there's not one nearby, you can have your veterinarian reach out to, you know, myself or the folks at Davis or whoever to get those appointments and get that information set up. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, okay, what about changing needs as um, the pets grow older? So, yeah, so changing the food. Yeah. Muscle mass, we have a question like, too about. Yeah. yeah. So senior and geriatric animals. So there really isn't a strict definition on when you need to you know, feed for senior versus adult. Um, so a lot of it is monitoring for common changes that happen as animals get older. So as they get older, if they start to gain weight, we may want to put them on a lower calorie diet just so that we're not gaining weight and worsening arthritis issues. Um, mm -hmm. If they've got kidney issues that show up, we may want to put them on a lower protein, lower phosphorus diet. So I typically will keep my patients on just whatever standard adult food they're doing well with, unless we have or until we have a reason to change. And then we change to suit that need. So we're just doing monitoring. This goes back to to having that relationship with your general practitioner, your primary vet, to make sure that your senior animal's going in for the annual wellness exams, it, which includes blood work and a urinalysis. So if we have changes that happen, we can catch it early and make those diet adjustments at that point. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, we have a question. I know this is very important, is the, the mean energy requirement. So 
you went over the calculation. We can send that out tomorrow. I know it, it yeah. can be complicated for yeah, people, it's, it's right? And it, yeah. Um, but I think just weight gain, right? As as the pets age, that's, that's mm -hmm. the main thing. Yeah. So we can send, we'll send that out tomorrow as well. Um, let's see. I know everyone wants you to pick brands, which, you know, it is hard to do. And then people are saying, you know, if it's, you know, AFCO approved, is that enough? Um, yeah. So so I usually look at when I'm looking at at companies, I have diet or company profiles that I like, if you want to, I guess, think of it that way, or company philosophies that I tend to okay. lean towards. Um, so I want a company that is doing that quality control. They're looking at, you know, the 50 gallon drum of the tan powder that comes in. I want them to know 100% sure and certainty that it's, you know, wheat ground wheat versus ground rice. I want them to know what they're putting into their foods. Um, I like companies that do their own like formulations and manufacturing in-house because they just have more control. But if they're a third-party manufacturer that does that oversight, I'm okay with that too. So I want companies that are paying attention to formulations and hiring experts to make the formulas, are doing the quality control to make sure they know what's going in those foods. And then doing the post-production quality control to make sure they know what's coming out the other end. So if I call a company and I ask how much sodium is in your food and they tell me that's a proprietary information, I don't want to feed that diet. Because to me, I hear the proprietary answer as I don't know. And I don't want to give you a no, I don't know answer. So I'm going to say it's proprietary. Because something like a nutrient level, they should have that information and they should willingly and readily provide it to you as a consumer. They should know how much sodium's in their diet. They should know how much selenium or zinc or whatever. It may be a range. They may be able to say it's, you know, minimum of this and a maximum of that. And it varies a little bit batch to batch, but that's still an answer. If they tell me proprietary, like that, to me, that raises some red flags. Okay. People aren't letting you <laughs> that easily. They're saying, oh, okay, great. What are they? And then someone said, a uh, sneaky question. What do you feed your own pets? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so I will send, um, I'll, the, the, the WSAVA mm -hmm. um, kind of recommended questions for pet food companies is very helpful. Great. Um, important thing to know is that AFCO and Wasava NRC, nobody approves diets. Diets yeah. don't have to go through any pre-market approval. They just have to have legal labels and be able to provide information to the FDA when asked. But there's no, like I could make, I could make Dr. Lee's nutrition biscuits tomorrow. And as long as I'm following all the legal requirements, there's no pre-market approval. So, so anytime a company says that we're, you know, approved by blah, 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 it's, it's a marketing tool. Um, so my dogs get a combination of a established company's dry food. They've been making pet food since the 1960s. My dogs love it. It's easy and convenient. And they get um, mixed with a commercial fresh food diet that's also been around for 10 plus years. Okay, okay. Um, what about, uh, you know, some of, again, I, we don't necessarily want to get into the brands, but these home delivery, you know, that come frozen or you could buy in, you know, yeah. any thoughts on those or? So the, the, a lot of the fresh food diets, it is a, a, a kind of a trendy avenue of the market. And if it gives you any idea on the trend, one of the companies was just bought by Mars last year. So Mars mm -hmm. owns a lot of pet food companies. They have Pedigree, they have Royal Canin, um, they've got the California Natural Line, they have IMS, they have a lot of different companies. And they just bought a fresh food diet company. So yeah. it's a it's a it's the kind of a, a, a definitely a trend. Now, fresh food diets, again, more digestible, more palatable for some dogs. And so it's a nice way to kind of blend in some of the more fresh food diet and, and phytonutrients in there. Um, but we need to make sure the company who's making the food knows what they're doing. Great. And okay. So um, back to right. who do they work for? So I would, and those are questions that you would ask. Like if you, if there's a particular mm -hmm. fresh food diet company that you're interested in, I would contact the company and say, who, who develops your formulas? And how often do you do your quality control analysis? And can you send me that analysis? I have a dog with special needs and I need to control, you know, the phosphorus level. Can you tell me what's in your food? And, and if they can't answer those questions or won't answer those questions, that would be concerning for me. 
Okay, great. We will send out the, a list of those questions. I know it's also on the website, but that we can provide people. <laughs> um, let's see. So, what else? I mean, prescription diets. You know, are, are those can those be helpful? Are they necessary? Yeah, I mean, so so over the counter versus the therapeutic diet lines, um, it, it can be helpful. So there are some therapeutic diets that have nutrient levels that are below what an adult healthy adult should get. So they're not necessarily restricted. They mean they're not necessarily below the requirement, but the kidney support diets, the kidney therapeutic diets are lower in protein and low in phosphorus to help manage those diseases. And if you have an otherwise healthy dog or cat, it could potentially be harmful to keep him on a restricted diet longer term. So some of the, the therapeutic diets are controlled for a reason. Other ones, things like the, the selected protein or the limited ingredient diets for allergies are, you know, they probably don't need a prescription necessarily, but what that prescription line does do is they control for the potential cross-contamination. So if you have an animal with a food allergy, with it, you know, they really do have a chicken allergy, you want to make sure you know exactly what's in your food. And so I that's the situation I would recommend sticking with one of the prescription limited ingredient diets, just so you have greater comfort that there's no chicken that's going to get accidentally introduced. Okay. Oh, great. Um, let's see. We have a question about a uh, carrageenan in cat in canned foods. Yeah, and I saw there was like a guar gum and xanthine gum in yeah. there too. So yeah. the the those are all used as gelling agents or fermentable fibers to help give the form. Um, they are all food safe. So nothing that's added in as any of those ingredients, um, they've all gone through. They're either they've gone through safety studies or they're considered grass or generally regarded as safe because they've been used in pet foods for 50 to 100 years. Um, the car carrageenan that's in pet foods is different than degraded carrageenan, which is used as is they're physically different structures. And so degraded carrageenan is not safe for anyone. They use it experimentally to induce intestinal damage to test different, different treatments. Um, that is not at all what's in pet foods. The only issue I've run into with the carrageenan or the guar guns or the xanthine gums in canned cat foods is they are fermentable fibers. And I have some patients that get looser stool or diarrhea when they eat too much fermentable fiber. So if it, if it causes the bacteria to overgrow or helps holds too much water in the poop, then your cat may get diarrhea if they're on a diet with carrageenan or guar gum in it. And so those are easy just to avoid. You look for diets that don't have those ingredients, but not, not harmful. It's not you know, going to cause any detrimental effects other than to your carpets or your bedding <laughs> and make your kitty uncomfortable, um, but safe to feed. Um, is it possible to cook if you want to cook for your pet? to also cook for yourself. You know, I, I know that some companies give the, just a, a, the dry, a mix that you can add in of, of nutrients. Does that yeah, work? So, so doing the home cooked, I mean, I, there are some diet, some companies that have these grain premixes where you just mm -hmm. add in, you know, it's like a bag of oats and dried berries and vitamins and minerals. Um, the concern I have with those is all the, the vitamin mineral supplements or powders that are being added in. If you look at the package, you see all the big chunks at the top and all the fine particles at the bottom. Mm. So what that means is when you're, it, unless you're physically shaking the bag every single time you use it, the top of the bag is going to be deficient in vitamins and minerals. The bottom of the bag is going to be excessive and potentially toxic levels of vitamins and minerals. Wow. So yes, over the course of a week or 10 days, however long it takes you to go through that bag, the dog or cat will ingest all of those nutrients, but it's going to be fluctuating between deficient and excess and potentially toxic levels, um, depending on where you are in the process. So I'm not a huge fan of the premixes unless again, shake it up every time. Okay. All right, great advice. And this is just a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I know we've gone way over, um, but thank you, Dr. Weath. This was great. And thank yeah. you to everyone for joining us tonight. And we, you know, we promise we'll send out a list of some resources tomorrow. Um, and thank you again. And yeah. everyone. And Michelle, just it also, if, if there's interest, I mean, I'm happy there's a lot of different topics that we could talk about. Like there, I saw a lot of supplement questions come through. Mm -hmm. 
So if we wanted to do another supplement in the future, in the future great. or Please, like how yeah. to deal with diarrhea or whatever it is. That would be <laughs> awesome. Yeah, any yeah, that would be great. So let's let's schedule it. Yeah. No, okay. thank you. This was really great. Um right. and, and I know there's like 10 more questions coming in now. I'm sorry everyone if I, I didn't get to yours, but um we really appreciate it. And thank you everyone and um have we wish you all you know have a wonderful rest of the summer and everyone stay safe and stay cool. and we'll see stay cool please yeah stay cool. <laughs> have a great night take bye, care everybody. bye bye